Hey guys, in this video I'm going to be talking to you all about the idea of op-amps and comparators. So by the end of today you should understand what an op-amp is and how it works, what it looks like, uh, and how you can use that in comparators. Particularly we're going to be looking at the gain equation um, and how that can arise to the behaviour of comparators. Um, and then we're going to look at some ideal properties of op-amps. Uh, so if I just expand this uh, image that I have on my screen, um, these are three different ways that we can show what an op-amp. So an op-amp um, is a tiny little circuit called an integrated circuit, uh, or IC. Now that always comes in a package like this. So physically they look like this, like a, a sort of grey box with some legs sitting out, sitting on them that you can solder stuff onto and you'll see that in the lesson. Often uh, this package will come with a, a, a description called a pinout and the pinout tells us uh, what each of these uh, connectors here, which are called legs, it tells us what they're connected to. And you can see I've got a dot here that dot matches up with an actual black dot on the object, so you can always work out which one's which. Over here, this is the most classic one, this is the one that you're most likely going to uh, come across day to day, and this is the circuit symbol for one. So we've got a couple of different inputs here. Uh, input P, we call that the inverting input, because that's what goes into it. Uh, and it has the symbol V with a superscript minus, so that's one that goes above it. Uh, the other one connected to the positive, well you might be able to work it out, this is called the non-inverting input. Um, and a, that will become clear to you later why we call it that, uh, but that has a symbol V+. Plus. Connected kind of halfway down the sides of this triangle, we have the supply voltages. Usually, uh, the magnitude of, the, of them are both the same. So for instance, I may have 7 volts and negative 7 volts. Usually the magnitude is the same, they just have opposite uh, signs. Not always though. Okay, And then out the end here, we have the output. That's what's coming out of my comparator, um, and we often give it the symbol V and then a subscript out. And it sounds a bit petty, but you have to get all of these uh, different uh, superscripts and subscripts correct and the correct terms when you're talking about these. Okay, so we're going to start off by thinking about an ideal op amp. So as you know, generally, especially when we're dealing with electricity, things don't act like an ideal case. So often, for instance, wires do have resistance, even though they're not supposed to according to the theory. Um, but today we're going to be thinking about ideal op-amps. So there are a couple of uh, properties of an ideal op-amp that you need to just know for your exam. So the first one is this idea that they have infinite gain. Uh, the gain comes from the gain equation, um, which I'm going to go through a little bit later. We also believe they have an infinite slew rate. So what does that mean? Well, let's imagine a graph of voltage against time. The slew rate is basically how quickly can it go from being up here at a high voltage to giving a low voltage output. So the slew rate is how quickly it can do that. So we assume that an ideal op amp can go instantaneously from a high voltage to a low voltage. We also believe that it has zero output resistance. What that effectively means is it can give an infinite c output current. Now clearly that's not the case. Uh, there will be some input resistance, but in practice it's normally pretty low. Uh, we also believe that it has infinite input resistance. Now that's a lot easier to achieve. Um, in actual practice, usually the input resistance is in the order of mega ohms, which is basically, for most circuits, you can imagine that the input is infinite. Uh, and we also believe it has infinite bandwidth. What does that mean? Well, that means that if my input voltage uh, is doing this, then obviously we can have a range of different frequencies. Um, so what infinite bandwidth means is that we believe that it will 
operate in exactly the same set of rules regardless of uh, the frequency of the input so it will act exactly the same again none of these are true but this is what we pretend is is the case to make a lot of the maths easier if you go on to do an electrical engineering degree you'll find that a lot of these are actually a little bit different okay so I asked I said earlier about this idea of infinite gain so what we need to understand then is what is gain so you may remember uh, a couple of years ago when you were doing uh, year 11 and we looked at magnification we said that the rate of magnification is equal to the image height divided by the object height so in other words it's how much you make something bigger and an op amp does just that so we can say that the gain which always has a symbol capital G is equal to the output voltage divided by the input voltage. This is where we're going to come into a few uh, other things that we need to talk about. So what is V out and V in and how do we kind of explain that? So what we can say is that we call the potential between these two points V in. Um, and we have to take one as uh, the larger and one as the smaller. So we can rewrite this equation as the gain is equal to V out divided by the potential or the voltage at the invert at the non-inverting input take away the inverting input. So if I rearrange that equation, I get v out is equal to the gain multiplied by the non-inverting input take away the inverting input so whatever potential is on is whatever the difference in those two potentials is i'm going to multiply it by my gain so just do a very quick worked example if i have a non-inverting input of 10 volts and an inverting input of 9 volts and a gain of 10 what will my V out be? Well, the difference between the two, V plus take away V minus is 1, multiplied by 10, sorry, is 10. For the second case, I've now made the non-inverting input smaller than the inverting input. So if we come down to this equation, V plus take away V minus is now minus 1. Minus 1 times 10 gives me minus 10 as my output. Here 10 take away 3 that gives me 7 times 10 will be 70 volts and then here 8.7 take away 8.6 that gives me 0 0.1 times 10 let's do it just by 10 again just for ease uh, will give me 1 as my output. There is one more thing that we need to understand about uh, our theory of this and that is that there's zero noise contribution. So when you do communication, uh, you'll look at it as a noise. But it's basically the idea that whatever the uh, we we don't add any extra signal into this. We either we just magnify a signal. We never add anything to it. Okay. So let's think a little bit about how we can use the gain equation and where we can get something quite cool out of this. So let's say back to our ideal op amp we said it has infinite gain if it has infinite gain then we can say that v out remember our general gain equation is the gain multiplied by the non-inverting input take away the inverting input in this case then that becomes v out is equal to infinity multiplied by v plus take away v minus let's just think of some examples here um, what would that give us if I had v plus of 1 or non-inverting of 1 and inverting of 0 what would my output voltage be well it's tempting to say something like this I know that v out will be infinity times 1 minus 0 which is infinity multiplied by 1 which should be infinite output voltage 
And straight away you can say, well, obviously not only is this an ideal op amp, it's clearly insane because none of the maths is going to work. But we're feeling something that that voltage output has to come from somewhere. So this is where it becomes really important to understand that we have, remember, Vs. We have uh, Vs plus and Vs minus, so the supply voltages. So if I say that my supply voltages are, say, 7 volts and minus 7 volts, then the most that my output can ever be is 7. So in this case, rather than being plus infinity, it will just be 7 volts. But then there starts to be something quite important here. If I have 0 0.001 volt on my non-inverting input and 0 volts on my inverting input, well, again, the non-inverting is larger, but because it's being multiplied by a huge number, my output will still be 7 volts, because it's still trying to be infinite, even though it's a small difference, a small difference multiplied by infinity is huge. So you can start to see some pretty interesting things. What about if I have 0 and 1? Well, that one will give me negative 7 volts, but I'm going to just change it now and call it minus Vs, because it's the negative of the supply voltage. What about if I have 8.999 and 9.000? Well, again, looking at the equation, we can see that the inverting is larger, so we get the negative of the supply. What about if I have 9.001 and 9.0000? Well, now I'm going to have the positive supply voltage. So maybe you can start to see why I call this the inverting and the non-inverting. Basically, if the inverting input is larger, the output becomes negative. It's inverted. If the non-inverting is larger, the output isn't inverted. It's still positive. So that's why we name them the way we do. Hopefully, you also notice that provided gain is infinite, V out is usually going to be either the, the positive supply voltage or the negative supply voltage. Because most of the time in a real circuit, the uh, one input will be larger than the other, except for a special case. What about if both of them, so sorry, let's go back a bit. Um, V out will be uh, the positive supply if the non-inverting input is larger than the inverting input. It will go negative if the non-inverting input is less than the inverting input. And probably straight away now the mathematicians among you are saying, well, what about when V plus is equal to V minus? Well, in that instance, if we come back to the gain equation, I'll have two identical numbers taking away each other, which is zero. Now, I know according to math mathematics, zero times infinity is undefined, but I'm a physicist, so I can say it's zero. So there's a special case when the output voltage will be zero. The rest of the time, it's either going to be the positive supply voltage or the negative supply voltage when it's set up like this. So let's think about an application of this. This is where we start to build up a slightly more interesting circuit. What you can see here is R1 and R2 are forming a potential divider. So what I can say about that is I am feeding in a known voltage or a reference voltage into the inverting input. I also have something here labelled just a random input, but this diagram is not really good enough for my purposes because we always need to reference something. So let's put in here two resistors. Okay, Now I can say that the input voltage, if I make this 
zero volts, I can now say that the input voltage is whatever the potential is across this resistor. So let's think about what via Vout could be under different circumstances. As I said earlier, now I've got a couple of different scenarios. I might have uh, V in, that's my input, being less than VR, my reference voltage. If that is the case, well, if I come back to the gain equation, I can see that V out is the gain multiplied by non-inverting, take away the inverting. Um, so I can see that if the input, now I'm going to say V plus is uh, connected to the input. So if the input is less than the reference, then that means that this term is going to be negative overall. So V out will be minus the supply voltage. If V in is greater than VR, then this term over here will become positive. So I will go to the positive of the supply voltage. And if V in is equal to my reference voltage, I'll get zero output. Why is that important? Well, remember what we've been doing in a couple of lessons. We keep asking, what about if I had something that turns on an LED? So if I connect this down to my zero volts here, how could I make some light come out in a certain circumstance? Well, what about if I put a thermistor here? If I put a thermistor here, then what I can say is that as the voltage across this thermistor increases, my non-inverting input becomes larger, which means it's more likely that I'm going to get an output that is very, very high. If I want to control that, I can make this resistor a variable resistor. Now, the really cool thing about that is this output is always going to be either completely negative or zero in a very edge case, or it's going to go immediately to the supply voltage. If we think about this over time, so let's think about uh, voltage against time. And we'll imagine that it's warming up. Yeah, let's say it's warming up. No, we're going to say it's cooling down because that's going to make it easier. So everything's getting cooling. It's getting cooler. So if I use a green line for my voltage across the thermistor, the voltage across my thermistor is going to be doing this. R1 and R2 are fixed resistors. So R1 and R2, so uh, the reference voltage is going to be constant. Like that. Yeah, constant straight line. So if we think about V out, well, at the start, voltage across the thermistor is less than the voltage across the reference. Now that means that my V out is going to be completely negative. And it's going to stay completely negative until the two are equal, in which case V out becomes negative, so it becomes zero. And as soon as the thermistor voltage is larger, as soon as the non-inverting input is larger than the input, inverting input, it's going to shoot up to the positive of the supply voltage and then just stay at this same high level. So I get this instant switch. And effectively, I've kind of made a sort of logic gate. But this is called a comparator. And it's a really, really useful circuit because you can see that it will stay at exactly one output until a predefined condition is met. And then it will suddenly give you exactly the opposite output, just the opposite sign. So a really simple application that is if I just whack that through a LED, the LED will either be completely off or completely on. There's no in-between stage, because if you think back to what we said about the ideal op amp, we say it has infinite slew rates. So it will immediately move from one to the other, an infinite gain. So there's only a, a tiny edge case where it would give a zero output. It's either completely negative 
or completely positive. Um, and that's a really, really useful circuit for a lot of problems where we want to use some sensors to make something happen under certain situations. We can go from having a big range of input voltages to a simple binary on or off, positive or negative output. Um, and that's a very, very useful device.